Yeah, I mean, I, I was the young adult pastor for five years. So I, I lived in this world of young adults trying to find, you know, their soulmate mm -hmm. and yeah. the one. And, and if um, they find them, then it'll be easy. Well, right, it'll be easy and it's great and, and rainbows and unicorns. But the, the reality is um, finding the right person is, um, if you just, again, if you do it by God's plan, right? It's not, I don't think that there's just the one person that's out there right. for you, but I think God gives us some principles in his word of going, man, when you're looking for someone to marry, first and foremost, do they love Jesus? Are they following Jesus? And, you know, I'll just tell you like young adults, missionary dating, don't do it. Like go out and find lost people and bring them to Jesus. Just don't bring them home. Welcome to the Real Life Overtime Podcast, the place where the members of the Real Life Ministries serving team go deeper into the weekend sermon. Watch them as they unpack, unfold, and unravel the weekend sermon like never before. So fasten your seatbelts, hit play, and join us for Real Life Overtime, where every episode is an adventure and this sermon doesn't end on Sunday. Hello, Real Life Ministries. Welcome to the Overtime Podcast. And uh, as a reminder, we do this podcast every week with the preachers who had preached at the different campuses on that uh, that weekend. And uh, right now we're in the series called Impressed, and we've been talking about the home sphere and and God's plan for for that. Uh, they were all in Christ, abiding in Christ individually, and then we're a part of a spiritual community of faith. And then and then uh, the parents. As believers, as a part of the, the spiritual community of faith, now what's their part in creating a home sphere? Uh, we've been talking about children and and the, the responsibility of the father and the mother towards impressing the faith upon their children. But this week, if you were to look at the book of Ephesians, you don't go from Ephesians 5, which is the church sphere, to Ephesians 6, which is the parenting sphere, without uh, really focusing in on the, the home sphere as it pertains to the marriage. God's plan was that the marriage um, would be a conduit of God's grace, of the truth, what's right and wrong, but also a conduit of grace and relationship. And as the parents are living out the, the standards of God uh, in their, their own personal relationships— that then creates a sincerity, a believability, so that when I start to talk to the kids, mm -hmm. they see we're actually living this. So not mm -hmm. that we don't make mistakes, but we're sincere. It's not a game. It's not church is church, work is work, and then I'm going to tell you something at home that I'm not actually trying to live out in my own personal life. And one of the things I said this last week was, why would your children want to be obedient to the Lord and, and obedient to you? If you're not being obedient to the right. Lord in how you treat your spouse and your family and your work and everything else, your mm -hmm. credibility is lost when you're being a hypocrite, telling them to do as I say, but not as I do. I'm going to be under the authority of the Lord, of others, so therefore I'm asking you to be under the authority of the Lord and me and others. And so now, now it becomes a real message mm -hmm. that, that's believable and there's credibility there. And so, you know, as you guys were thinking about what you guys taught, uh, Blake, wh where did you go this week on this uh, marriage aspect? Yeah, uh, very similar. Um, the setup for us, too, was a similar language, uh, but different, is, you know, I had made mention that the best way for your kids to observe from you, right, with the whole impression idea, not necessarily what you say, right? As a parent, I can fall into that trap of, like, do what I say, not what I do. Mm -hmm. We talked about that idea. Um, but the way in which you could best model for your children to be children that would listen, trust you as a parent, to pass on the good things of the Lord, is to watch you emulate that in your personal relationship with God and your spouse. So you want your children to be obedient, show them that you're obedient to the Lord. You want your children to trust and sacrifice and be giving themselves away for another person, show how you're doing that to the Lord with your spouse. Mm -hmm. And so a very similar statement with that. Um, the encouragement piece that I always like to put on the front end is the model and example that God gives us, should we fail, as we do, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, that the marriage idea is to be a model of the covenant relationship that God has already put on display between us and his people. And so when we are faithless or we are fearful, God's not. And so if I'm not that person, 
with my spouse and my kids see that and they will, they can still go, Hey, I'm trying to be like Jesus. and I'm trying to be like God and he's always faithful and he's just, and he's merciful. So we're trying to show in our marriage relationship, uh, the emulation of what God has been for us, which mm-hmm. is the story that we pass on. Mm-hmm. And we fail at that. And to say, you know, there's been a history of a people that fail and here's who God is to his people when they fail. And here's who God is to us when we fail each right. other in our marriage. Yeah. And so we're going to share that and right. we're going to talk about that and mm-hmm. that reality and that modeling of here's who God is with his people. Here's who we're trying to be for That's ourselves good. is what we pass down. That's good. So similar. That's yeah. good. Mm-hmm. Well, Jim, where did you go this week? Uh, We talked about uh, God's blueprint, his plan. We talked about oneness. We talked about um, unity, the partnership itself and marriage. Um, We talked about roles, which um, I think is very important if we're going to understand God's blueprint. Mm -hmm. We we addressed the role of the husband and the role of the wife and how they are really meant to complement one another. And it's just so grounded and woven Mm -hmm. together in Scripture. You know, um, Paul's picture in Ephesians, starting all the way back at chapter one about our identity and two about our salvation, and then three, the dividing wall is down between Greek and Jew, and that submissive thing that we get to in chapter five that we probably all use this weekend, submit one to another, Mm -hmm. um, was not just thrown in there for women to submit. It's actually the thread that Paul paints that starts all the way back to Jews, Gentiles, and how they can, within the body of Christ, be unified in one Mm -hmm. in reverence to Christ, and just tied that together in our unique roles as husband and wives. Yeah, Yeah, that's good. That's that's the thread throughout. Mm -hmm. Gabe, what, what, what about you? Where'd you, where'd you go? Similar to all these guys. Yeah. I mean, we, the, the week was, was, um, titled the partnership and, uh, and so I took it from a macro to a micro level. The whole series we've been talking about, the partnership between the home and the church and how those, um, those two spheres of our life need to come together to raise godly offspring mm-hmm. and raise up the next generation. And so I took the idea of the partnership from a macro level and went down to the partnership in the micro level, the home being the husband and the wife. And what does that look like? In Ephesians 5 and 6, as we're talking about, it, mm-hmm. it lays it out very clearly what that's supposed to look like. And I said, guys, this is God's plan for the home yep. is super simple. But it's not always easy. Uh, it's simple, and so I just said, I just said um, in uh, Ephesians five twenty one, I said God's plan starts with reverence. Out of reverence for Christ, submit one to another. So first of all, we have to have a reverence for Christ. We have to have a healthy fear of God, of living outside of His will, His way, and His wisdom. And so the reverence for Christ is what's going to drive the home to be that that partnership. And then I talked about how God's plan includes submission and love, which is what mm-hmm. you're talking about, Blaze, the different um, roles of the husband and father and, or the husband and wife and, um, you know, submitting and, and loving and, and that whole, those, those roles. And then I, I ended by saying, and God's plan demands obedience. Um, and so talking about the, the kids um, and, and obeying their parents. And the point that I made, I even talked to the kids in, in the service. It was really good. I said, you know, I go, guys, this is our favorite, like, parent verse, right? <laughs> like, um, children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is the right thing to do, Ephesians 6.1. And, and uh, I said, but, but here's the heart behind it. Here's the heart behind why we're telling you to obey. It's not for behavior modification. It's for heart transformation. Mm-hmm. We want to get our kids' hearts to a place where they're going, because of my love for my parents, I want to obey them. And it's what Jesus said in, in John 15, 14, or 14, 15. He said, if you love me, you'll obey me. So there's a heart posture that's attached to our obedience. And so everywhere else in life, your school, your work, your relationship with God, there's obedience that's required. So we're not just saying, be good little boys and girls so you'll behave and not make my life easier. Mm. We're actually going after your heart and setting you up in life to have that heart posture towards God and towards other people in your life. That's good. good. Yeah, I touched on partnership as well, and um, really says out of reverence for Christ, submit therefore one to another, and then it gives the way in which we Mm -hmm. submit to one another. For the wife, it's to submit to their husband, uh, let him lead, stand down, and respect him. Mm -hmm. And then I talked about how some people will say, well, when my husband's respectable, I'll respect him. And no, you do it out of reverence for Christ with right. the strength that he provides. To the man, it's humility because you're actually in love 
biblical love requires an act of the will to lay down my life for you. And so in, it, you're actually, um, I'm, I'm, I'm leading you towards Christ and the washing of the Word, and I'm going to lay down my life for you. It doesn't mean I just follow you around and give you whatever you want. I'm following Christ. And as Jesus followed God, gave us an example, but as he went, he did it because he loved them, and he washed their feet, and he cared for them, but he was still leading. Mm-hmm. So what does it actually look like uh, to lead and be a partner? And and what does humility look like? But, it, it, you know, the other part of it was, what does partnership look like? And I talked about how men will often go, okay, I'm the boss, and I'm going to do what I think, and your job is to help me, because that you're a help meet. It's actually help meet in Hebrew, not help mate, but help meet. And... Uh, and I said, no, partnership is, you understand, you're, it's not good. You're not good. You're incomplete. You need, you need help. You need to help me. Everybody needs to help me. So the, her job isn't just to submit to your plan. It's she gets to be a part of creating the plan because she sees parts that you don't see. Mm-hmm. And so she, uh, we help each other. Yes, as a husband, your role is to um, facilitate the discussion that God wants us to have about how we're going to lead pe- our children to know the Lord, and we're going to create the plan together, we're going to implement the plan together, and when the battle is on and it's hard, we're going to comfort each other and help each other relationally get through the battle mm-hmm. as those who are trying to lead buck the system, try to divide, uh, make it harder, There's pain that comes when you're trying to raise your children, and it, mm-hmm. there, something disappointing happens, and then you help each other get through the dark uh, night of the soul. Mm-hmm. So there's a creating the plan, implementing the plan together, and then helping each other when the plan doesn't go the way we wanted. Yeah. And so we did. We talked about about that. And, um, you know, I, I thought about this. We, we talked about in, in uh, I think, all three of our places, there's the reactive and the proactive. The proactive is we want to teach people what the plan's supposed to look like because they don't know. So if they haven't been married, they're single, we want to raise up kids who know how it's supposed to look, because oftentimes they don't know. Even their parents in the Christian church didn't model this or weren't discipled in this or rejected it outright and kind of have a hodgepodge version of a little bit of Oprah, a little bit of culture, whatever. And um, we want them to know what the plan is, and then um, I said... But there's also the reactive part of that. What if you didn't know, you didn't do it, now you're living in a mess? What do you do now? And we're going to actually talk about that next yeah. week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, when it comes to kids and you're talking about marriage, let's talk about why it's so important that our kids actually understand what this is supposed to look like so that they choose the right person to come into a partnership with. The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Now, mm-hmm. what happens if you are mm-hmm. and you're a Christian and you're already married? Well, that's we're going to talk about that in a minute. But if our kids don't understand what marriage is, then, hey, she's good looking or he's good looking and he likes me. And so uh, I'm attracted yeah. to him or, uh, you know, but if you understand the way it's supposed to be and what God wants it to look like, then who you choose really matters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, Gabe, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I was the young adult pastor for five years, so I, I lived in this world of young adults trying to find, you know, their soulmate mm-hmm. and yeah. the one. And and if um, they find them, then it'll be easy. Well, right, it'll be easy, and it's great, and, and <laughs> rainbows and unicorns. But the, the reality is um, finding the right person is... Um, if you just, again, if you do it by God's plan, right? It's not, I don't think that there's just the one person that's out there for you, but I think God gives us some principles in his word of going, man, when you're looking for someone to marry, first and foremost, do they love Jesus? Hmm. Are they following Jesus? And, you know, I'll just tell you, like, young adults, missionary dating, don't do it. Like, go out and find lost people and bring them to Jesus. Just don't bring them home, right? Like, like, like Mm -hmm. if they're not following Jesus... Wait until they are, right. and then go date them, right? And, and then there's this reality of like, well, well, I want to help them know who Jesus is. It's not your role to date them to Jesus. It's your role to pray, to pray for them and be a friend to them and model to them who Jesus is. But if they're not following him, then what's your expectation for when you get together? All of a sudden, they're just going to fall in love with Jesus because you are? And so um, I just— but Not I, to mention, a lot of times they'll say what they need to say. 
to get you to date them. To get you to date them. Totally. Because we know we put our best foot forward and, and you know, we're trying to attract somebody. Totally. Well, and I, and I, I just think that our culture bleeds into even the decision-making paradigm that a lot of young adults have. I, I think it's really important that we understand that sin does not change God's blueprint, God's plan. Mm. And so irregardless of how the world looks at what doesn't work because of sin, mm -hmm. it's still the right and only plan that God has. Totally. And I think the culture we're in right now is just loudly screaming at the young adults to go, that didn't work. It didn't work for my parents. It doesn't work. So we're going to create something else, yeah. some hybrid model that we think is going to work. Well, or, and, and that's that's what young adults are, are looking at is they're going, you know, if, if I look to date someone, um, you know, together we'll grow our relationship with with God together. And while that that can be true, like we can, my wife and I, we grow our relationship with God together. But it takes a healthy individual following Jesus, a healthy individual right. following Jesus, then coming together and deciding to follow Jesus together. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, there's no um, uh, reconciliation or redemption that can be had if you choose someone who's not following Jesus. My wife and I were not following Jesus when we met each other. God's redeemed that. He can mm. redeem that. But are you willing to roll the dice on that? Or are you willing to go, man, Lord, even if it means giving up on this person who's really attractive and who makes me happy and who I can see a future with, giving up on that temporarily to wait for your best because your best is better than my best. So am I willing to give up the attraction and the desires and you know to, to follow what you're calling me to do? And, and God's plan is always better. Well, and remember why, though. Um, the goal is to raise up godly offspring. When right. you have children, you realize that one of the most important things in your life is you want to spend eternity with them. Yeah. And you, there's a love there that you have that you didn't know you had, that you would have. And it, whether you adopt a child or you, you, uh, you, know, you, you marry and have children yourself, there's something that comes with that little child and you go, wow, I want them to have the life that God had for them. Yeah. The problem is, if you marry that person and that person is willing to say whatever, they check the box, I'm Christian, you know, and um, you're, you've got to be careful who you marry because you're being yoked together. That's right. right. You know, when you think about yoked, the Bible says don't be unequally yoked. You've got a yoke where you take two cattle and you put them together and they pull. There's more strength together as they pull in the same direction. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then... But what happens if you're unequally yoked, and and well, that means you're carrying all the weight, or they're actually pulling in a different direction, right. or they're not even the same kind of animal, mm -hmm. and and uh, and now uh, I'll just say this: some people are like, "But this might be the only person I ever get, uh, so I got to take what I can get." No, I want you to understand that sounds great until you start trying mm -hmm. to go. I got kids; I want to raise them to know Jesus, and he's more interested in football, or he doesn't understand what love is. And because he doesn't have the fruit of the Spirit in, his, in him, he can't actually love. He's not directing your kids in the same direction. Mm -hmm. For a quick fix, it's a lifetime of struggle for so many people. And it, it, what I would say is to be with the wrong person is actually more painful than to be alone. Sure. For, than to be single. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't sound like it would be true. But when you're supposed to be loved, you're supposed to be pulling together, you're supposed to be caring, to have the same idea, the same language, going in the same direction, and with kids who are watching, um, and, and they're going to want to fall dad if you're a woman, you know, mm -hmm. and yet dad's falling himself and doing his... The amount of pain that comes with this, you got to be careful who you choose. Yep. Blake, what are, what are your thoughts? I know yeah. you do marriage counseling with, in young marrieds and... Yeah, so much that goes with it. Um, you know, I'm thinking through thoughts, nothing that has not already been said before, but like, yeah, it can be painful, right? Waiting in the process and, and having the desire to want to be married is a great thing, right? By God's design. Um, but yeah, you pick your difficulty, right? The difficulty of waiting and being obedient and hoping that God actually is working and has a plan that you don't have to control it. His mm -hmm. timing is best, even if it's longer than you think, um, is a yes, can, is, is a better challenge to wait through than it is to fight through being unequally yoked or entering into a partnership that is not on the premise of what God has. Mm -hmm. Some of the things we talked about this week too, um, which is God's design for marriage with man and woman in the beginning, is yes, that we partner with each other, but we're also in a partnership with God. 
which is to put God's truth on display. And, and we live that out in our marriage. And shooting to have that be the goal of your marriage, with the purpose of marriage, is to help partner with God and your spouse. Um, if that's not the goal, then if the goal is my preference over my purpose, then we find ourselves in that unequally yoked situation. And I would agree. I've had more conversations on the back end of a marriage agreement on how much harder and how much destruction and how much painful it's been rather than being patient in the process of choosing to enter into... It, it, by the way, it's really interesting <laughs> because your wife was a Christian girl right. in a Christian home mm -hmm. who started dating you when you were not a Christian. Mm -hmm. And yet she held firm, held boundaries. You actually came to know the Lord right. and she would have... I know her. She would if you if there wasn't massive change in your life, she was only going to let it go so far. Right. Well, and then I, like Gabe said too, like God can work through the redemption of it, right? Mm -hmm. And the wisdom and the influence from her parents for her to have that be with me to say, hey, listen, this is what it means to be married. This is what it means to have a relationship that's looking towards marriage. It's not marriage, and so until it is, this is what it's going to look like. Yeah. And by the way, this is the purpose of what it looks like. Is so that we can be this, right? To be in, in your and case, you I didn't know came to know Jesus through her, through oh. who they really were. She wasn't right. just a pretender, and her parents weren't pretenders, right? But my motivation was nothing like that. Like you said, I was that. That was I didn't understand what the purpose of that was to be for, right? And so I, I learned through that process. But yeah, I think that there's a lot of significance that goes into it. And you know, last thing I would say is we steal this often from Gary Thomas, but right, the intent of my marriage, if it's not if it's not to help make me holy and set apart and know who God is, that is God's design for it, not just to make me happy mm -hmm. or to find my identity or to be fulfilled in finding another person because those temptations and that motivation, right, can seem like it's a good fix at the time, but ultimately causes more challenge down the road. Yeah, yeah and I also think uh, the church community is really vital to this. I'm just thinking about people that, like you were talking about, Gabe, uh, guys that are waiting or gals that are waiting because they're waiting to for maturity to surface, right? And, and a partnership that that uh, is really grounded. And and I think that waiting period is is so much healthier when it's done within the context of community because yep. you have a chance to have other people speak in your life. Your emotions mm -hmm. are high. You're like, I need this. I've got to have are this. High. Hormones, all that stuff screaming. To have other people walk beside you and go, it's going to be okay. I know you. Mm -hmm. God has someone for you. Mm -hmm. Hold <laughs> fast. Don't compromise. You know, without accountability. I mean, we this we saw this weekend. God puts an an authority and accountability structure in place scripturally. Mm. It's all there. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things uh, quickly too that we talked about. Um, you know, in the context of a marriage, right? We talk about mutual submission, right? And that the model that God gives us through Christ Himself, and even God in the journey of His people through Israel, is one that is sacrificial. Mm -hmm. Right, it's submissive. It's considering yourself to put yourself asunder somebody else. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a sacrifice and like a perseverance that goes within the marriage relationship. Well, the beautiful thing that I love about that is God sets that up even if if we're a single person that's waiting. Yeah. So the practice of being sacrificial and having to wait and waiting for what God's timing is is just a similar but different ideology before we get married. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's we can yearn for what that looks like yet we can still have that partnership with God right now and practice it. And sometimes it is a long suffering and sometimes it is a difficulty. It's just a different version of it, right? Once you get married. Mm -hmm. And so God has a plan for each person, <laughs> right? And to look upon that. And so I think practice for that can be something that we're done going, okay, God, I'm gonna trust your story and your timing. I'm gonna look with wisdom into being equally yoked for the partner that you have for me. And then once you find it, it's perfect and easy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So no. it's, same, it's same and different. So yeah, it's yeah. a process to get there. But it's the same know. thing people say. You know, yeah. if you accept Jesus, He's going to take your problems away. Sure. No, He took the biggest problem away: mm. hell, mm. domination of sin, um, deception from the enemy. But now it's this onward journey of dying to self daily and growing. It's the same in marriage. Right. You're it, you've you've you've. Now you've started a marriage, you're committed to it, mm. and now the act of daily denying yourself and serving and doing those things, that's an internal battle. That's that Your ability to win in that will determine your ability to win in your relationship. But again, if they don't even have that idea of dying to self and right. the Holy Spirit 
working in you to to care about others more than yourself. And they they they've been a, they've adopted the world's version of things, mm-hmm. and and they're the voices in their head are find yourself. It's about you, your own happiness. Well, that's going to play out in your marriage, and it's going to deeply impact your children. Yeah. Well, and also, Jim, and you talked about it this week. As I watched your message, and you talked about the reality that God hates divorce. Right. And, mm-hmm. and it's so important to proactively find the right person. And you can't safeguard anything in life. The right person now could do something stupid later and could end a marriage, right? right? But to the best of your ability, you find the person that you go, man, this is someone that loves Jesus, that I'm going to spend the rest of my life. The covenant you're making between that person and God right. is forever. It's it, it, you know, And I think so easily people go, I find the wrong person, I'll just leave them. We'll just do divorce. We fall out of love. And it's, it's just as easy as that, right? It's just... It didn't work out, big deal, move on to the next. And that was never God's plan. It right. was always meant to be a lifetime. So anybody who's been in a blended family after after divorce oh knows it's so much easier than <laughs> the first one. Or, or a blended family or just yeah, step-parents. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was my story. I mean, yeah. just, you know, raised by a single mom with four boys and... It did not make it easier, you know. No. It was it was, it was terrible. Mm-hmm. But God can redeem it. God can step into whatever yeah. mistakes we've made yep. and start to go. Okay, you're ready to follow me now. It doesn't mean the consequences don't aren't there that you have right. to work through, but God can help you through that and redeem it. Yep. One one one. Let's kind of close with this idea. We could be talking about this all day, right? Mm-hmm. But. And we care so much about our young families and setting them off right. But what about, uh, okay, I, I got saved after I got married. He's not a Christian. Or I thought he was a Christian, but but uh, he wasn't because I, he was attractive and he went to church. He must be a Christian. I didn't look at the fruit because I was one of those young person who was just looking for love. Or, or you know, as time went on, I actually became more faithful. And now I'm, but what do you do in this situation where you're stuck in, in a situation where you're not actually on the same page. You're not f- trying to raise your kids up for the same reason. You're not thinking eternally. What do you do as a person, husband or wife, where the other one just isn't uh, working with you towards eternity? Mm-hmm. We talk a lot about God's part, my part, their part. And I think it's awesome that um, that God, however he orchestrates it and works it out in his sovereignty, of two non-believers coming together and and either one or both deciding to follow Jesus. It's it's first of all, thank you, Jesus, that you do that. You know, thank you that you redeem and you restore. Um, and I would just I would just encourage the person who is following Jesus and is in a marriage with someone who's not, you can only do your part. Right. And you gotta trust that God is working on their life just as he worked on yours before you f- decided to follow Jesus. And so what does that look like practically? I mean, you're praying for that spouse. You're you're encouraging them to if they're willing to, to come to church or come to life group. And I mean, get Christian people around you as much as you possibly can. Have those Christian influences that are constantly speaking into their life. And there's people on our staff now that have that reality. And and I know, Jim, that you know some of the people are talking about, and it's the intentionality of getting other Christians in their life to, mm. to be that influence. And ultimately, I mean, I don't want to try to make it seem like it's just as simple and all you do is that, but you got to go, Lord, I trust you with my spouse. Please do whatever it takes to bring them to their it, knees. But you said something. You can't do the other person's part, you can't do which their part. assumes, though, that you are going to do your part. Right. You, ha- you can only do your part. Right. right? You can and only so do then part. sometimes we don't know what that is, which is that that's back to the point of having Christian people. It's hard to deal with a, a sermon with all the nuances that deal with every situation. Right. But if you have spiritually mature people around you in the body of Christ, you can work through what your particular part is, and get the right idea. You'd, you'd Ultimately, you'd like to, we were talking about a helpmate mm-hmm. whose job was to help create the plan, implement the plan, and then be a support to you even when it goes awry, right? In the same way, having some partners, uh, some if you're a young woman, an older woman, some godly counsel where you help create your part of the plan, and then help you to implement that with accountability and support for you to be that part that God wants you to be in that home with those kids in an honoring godly way. Yeah. The Bible talks about in first Peter for women who are married to unbelievers yeah. mm-hmm. that they could be one without a word to them. But that doesn't, that still means that you have to do your part of being a godly influence with your children. Right. That's a part you could step into. Ultimately you were supposed to have a, a husband do that. He isn't. So you can't go, well, I'm not going to do, I can't do that because he's not, and there's nobody to do it. No, you can step in with God's help to do your part, 
um, and and be a godly influence in that person's life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Well, uh, it, it, this is we're going to talk more about this this next week in this message, and we're talking about the gaps. What happens when? Okay, here's God's plan. We, I, I didn't do it, or somebody else didn't do it, or here I am. Somebody died. I'm a widow, widower. You know, what do I do? We're going to talk about that this next week, and do more in that. But uh, I want I want to encourage you folks. Uh, get into the Word. We first got to know what the plan is. Then we know how far away from from where we are uh, to the plan. And then we got to go. Okay, what do we do with the gap in our own life? How do we help others fill in the gap? What part do I play to help somebody? You know, if I'm going to ask for help, great. But I got to have somebody who's willing to be God's voice in my life and make themselves available to that. What does it look like to be the church that works with the family, and uh, and ultimately? Um, to entrust to God uh, the plan to abide in Him so I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I mean, again, without abiding in Christ, who I am in Christ, and in the power source and the plan, and then the, it, without that, this all just becomes a really nice idea. But ultimately, what we're trying to do here is say, God does have a plan. We're trying to disciple and be disciples of Jesus in every sphere of our life. So I look forward to next week. Thanks, guys, yeah. to helping this Overtime Podcast. Yep. Love you guys. Yep. Blessings. Thanks.